people don't think they want to interact with people because they don't want to be sold. But at the same time, they want advice. They want to be consulted with. They want expertise in the area that they're looking to buy from. And so we have to train our sales team to be that consultative partner. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do. But how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of B2B EQ. Today's guest has a unique understanding of the skills needed to close deals and win revenue. She's an expert at building relationships and acts as a North Star, guiding her teams to success. Recognized in her past as a top seller, yes, she has carried a bag and she has been a seller, so she knows what it's like. But now, VP of Sales Enablement and Product Marketing at Co-op Solutions, Casey Stenson. Casey, great to have you. Great to be here. Thanks so much. Yeah, well, we got to catch up earlier and I have to start off with the uniqueness of your role. It's a perfect combination, but sales enablement and product marketing. How did that kind of come to be at Co-op Solutions and kind of what was the the brainchild behind coming into that role? Sure. So I had about 12 years of experience, as you mentioned, in sales. So I was, um, I carried a bag for five years and then I was a sales leader for about seven, um, leading a team across Southern California, Hawaii area. Um, So I got really solid sales experience, had success as an individual and success as a team. And um, I had a mentor who had asked me to do some consulting for her um, in terms of sales enablement because in my sales career in the pharmaceutical industry, they really pour a ton of um, science, effort, um, marketing, intel into making reps really top of the line representatives. And so she said, can you help me take some of that goodness and bring it to our financial technology company? and build a sales enablement function. Um, So that was the start of my path at Co-op Solutions. And I was super excited to build essentially a function that was in its infancy. And after about, I don't know, maybe six months, um, there was a need to fill the product marketing um, leadership area. And after my first six months, I said, this makes a lot of sense to also Mm -hmm. um, be led by me because I'm working with the product marketing team all of the time. Um, I need to know what's coming up in the pipeline. I need to help influence positioning and messaging early on in our PDLC product development life cycle. And Mm -hmm. ultimately that's going to help me, me and my team better understand our products and services from the very start so that we can build ideal sales tools and training for product launch. So um, I've heard of a few others in similar positions, but I do know that it's not always the combo that people think of, but in my organization and with my experience, it absolutely works. I love that because I first want to hit on the part of product marketing to sales enablement to sales using something out in the field. And the joke, and I'm sure a bunch of our listeners are going to say, oh, yeah, all that content that marketing gives us that we never use. Now, coming from a sales enablement (laughs) background and being tight with sales, it makes sense that you'd have a really good pulse on what's working in the market to then influence your product marketing. How's that played out at Co-op Solutions? And what are some of the benefits you've seen? It's absolutely played out. Um, I think even just taking my um, sales tools from my past life and thinking about, okay, that was patient type and patient focused and insurance, but now it's credit union type 
it's mm -hmm. um, core provider, they are di different technology environments. So what makes a credit union unique is not un or dissimilar to what might make a patient in a doctor's office unique. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to know and rely on my experience about what I used in my sales career and then translate that to this new environment, new industry um, has really been beneficial. And don't get me wrong, um, just because I was a salesperson doesn't mean that I know everything about financial technology sales. Um, now I know a lot more than I did when I started, but I had to also create a very tight feedback loop and build very strong relationships with our sales teams so that I could continue to hear them out, understand what they're saying, and then translate their challenges into sales tools and sales training. That was my next thing is the feedback loop backwards. You're already ahead yeah. of me on this one. So All right. how do you capture that today? How do you work with your sales team? Tell me about that partnership. Maybe some marketers listening to this or sellers listening to this going, gosh, I wish there was more connection there. How, how does that come together for you? Yes. Um, it's, it's something that takes time. Um, mm -hmm. Building trust and building a feedback loop with honest responses and honest feedback takes time because Either. like you yes and like <laughs> you said tim they um there is a historic um belief that marketing you know doesn't know exactly what sales needs so you have to mm -hmm. overcome that and i do that in a variety of ways um i think the biggest most um formal so to speak feedback loop that I have is a sales enablement task force. And oh, cool. that is comprised of, we have different types of sellers in our organization. We have a relationship sales, net new business sales, sales engineers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and so that group is a cross section of all of those groups coming together. Um, there are about 10 of us. We come together every other month we have an opportunity. I bring new initiatives, new programs, new marketing materials, ideas for training, um, bring that to the group, always keeping space for them to bring ideas back to me um, mm -hmm. and making sure that they are heard. And then I think a lot of people are successful at asking but then closing that loop and then showing them how you implemented their feedback is a huge piece that can't be missed. So I always start the meeting with, here's what we heard last time, and here's what we've done to solve for it, or here's what we're working on to solve for it. And then we you know, repeat the same cycle. Mm -hmm. And I also share that with the larger sales team. So. We start with that at the sales enablement task force meetings. And then I bring that also to our sales enablement webinars, which we can talk about in a bit, yeah. um, which have our entire CRO organization on the phone. So I say, here are the members of the task force, share your feedback with them. They come to me and also here was their feedback and here's how we're solving for it. So awareness and, um, closing that loop. That's a good tactic. And I want to know more about this webinar. So you do a, sure. uh, how often is it? Um, the your webinar, webinars? it's every three weeks. Oh, wow. Is that, nice. is that a often or not often? That feels like for a lot of organizations, right? It's, it's a challenge. There's balance. There's some that get together often and do training kind of on a monthly basis or mm -hmm. more asynchronously. I've talked to some organizations that are like once a quarter, but gosh, don't put it near the start or end of a quarter because that right. time's off limits. Right. So yeah, it, I think it varies. Okay. Well, ours is every three weeks. Um, we had them monthly for a few years and we determined we needed them more frequently. Mm -hmm. um, but we try and keep them as brief as possible and really to topics that matter. And we also have some breakout sessions that are for those specific 
selling types so that we're not wasting anyone's time sharing information right. about something that's not relevant to them. I think you just pulled something out, which is no matter how often you do it, knowing your audience and making sure that it's fit for them. I've been on so many enablement sessions where it's it's general knowledge or it's or it's maybe not general, maybe it's specific to a segment like an industry vertical and the rest of the organization's going, okay, camera's off. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll sit back on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Very nice. That makes a lot of sense. So how do you measure and kind of quantify the success of sales enablement? I know it's a, it's a, it's like marketing. Sometimes it can be a very gray area or a, a tough to put a number to. What are some of the things you yes. look for both qualitative sure. and quantitative measures maybe? Sure. So we have improved um, our ability to measure over the years since I've been here and just recently this year, I would say, looking at our 2022 insights, we've been able to find an even stronger correlation. And I'll explain how we achieved that. Um, so we have a few different modes of analysis. We have Seismic, which we use as our sales enablement platform. Nice. And within Seismic, we're able to see the activity that our teams are using, um, our tools and accessing our information. We're able to see when they're looking at those tools and using them for self-study or their own training purposes. And then we're also able to see when they're actually what we call using the information, which would be sharing it with a client, downloading it and putting it into an email, um, there's a feature called Live Send where they can actually send a document through Seismic. So we look at that. We also okay. are able to, and then this equation all comes together at the end. So that's the first yeah. piece of it. Um, then we're also able to look at our webinar, sales enablement webinar activities. So how are people showing up? Are they engaged? Um, how frequently are they showing up? I mentioned every three weeks we have them. So are they coming back time and time again? And we compare those numbers to those same individuals. So we're able to see individual by individual and are they meeting their quota that year? And what we were able to find was that those who use seismic 55% more and heavily attend our sales enablement webinars, which we defined as seven or more, they mm -hmm. are more likely to achieve or exceed quota compared to those who do not. The so, proof's in the pudding. What's that? <laughs> I said the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding. So yeah. um, that's one statistic. We're also able to show that those who participate in our webinars, if they're a client relationship, um, executive bring in two times the amount of ACV versus those who do not. And we have a few sub stats that we're able to share also. Um, but back to your point about, you know, frequency of, of training and education, when you have those types of stats to point to, um, all of a sudden it becomes a lot more appealing for your sellers to participate. Absolutely. So, um, those are some of the, the, the stats that we look at. Of course, we get a lot of feedback too in our sales enablement task force that I mentioned earlier. So um, more of that qualitative feedback, word of mouth, um, just conversation from building relationships on um, are we talking about the right things? Is this resonating? Are, you know, are what we are training on um, what they're experiencing in the field? And so we're able to kind of translate some of that into um, correlation and impact on revenue. Now, how do you look at the qualitative aspect? You, you shared something with me and I will pull this quote because I thought this was very profound. And I think okay. your CRO said it. It was, emotion is the currency of our buyers. Yes. So 
that points to me that someone's sentiment, someone's gate engagement, how a buyer feels about the engagement is critical, not only to the success of a deal, but also something your CRO is very focused on. How yeah. do you measure or get reads on that qualitative side of, of everything? So the way that we, I, I don't think, and I'd be open to ideas on how to measure that other than, not, yeah. um, you know, as a, as an impact, but I would say that we hear often through peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities that we make available through our sales enablement channels, um, the importance of being um, one who connects with human connection, being mm -hmm. genuine. Um, it's, I think it's easier to do business with people you enjoy. Um, mm -hmm. So making sure you're building that connection is so important. So as far as a measure, I, I can't pinpoint anything specific other than we hear about it often. We're yeah. training on it often to make sure that those types of competencies are scaled. And um, it really takes very careful and selective execution. Um, so hearing how others are able to finesse that is important to share. It's it's a tough question. And I, and I threw that out there because I think it's the, the one thing that we all struggle with, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's really easy to see the activities that are being done in a sales room. But now with most people either working remote or in a hybrid environment, meeting people over Zoom or different video aspects, like getting a, a pulse on how a buyer feels has become even more of a, a challenge, I think, than ever before. Um, the feedback loops, though, I think is what you're talking about. And again, it goes back to your first point on trust with your sellers. Do you get those anecdotes from buyers that come back often that you kind of say, ooh, I, we, we've won this deal because we've really wowed that person or impressed that buying group? Is that kind of the metric that you go by then? Uh, yes. Um, and actually, just very recently, I had one of our sellers read me a thank you note after closing a deal from the buyer. And it was exactly that. It was like, I, you know, I knew you were the type of people who we wanted to work with after our very first meeting. You were engaged. You, you know, knew, knew X, Y, Z about me. And to that very point, I think the end was actually something like, and it sure makes it a whole lot easier to do business with people that you enjoy. And so yep. we're looking forward to this partnership. So it's absolutely referenced. Um, we are always analyzing our um, selling process, our buying. We want to make our organization as client centric as possible. So we listen to our clients very frequently. Um, we have client councils that we set up and various listening posts. So we will often receive these verbatim type feedbacks that talk about the importance of our people and how our people at Co-op Solutions are one of our most valuable assets. Um, so I absolutely agree that people, that connection, the emotional currency, um, all play a huge role in um, buying and selling. It, it is human to human. And, and I think you, you said it spot on. We don't buy from people we usually don't like or don't trust. Mm -hmm. right? I, I can't think of a big purchase. Maybe if you didn't have to talk to anybody and we, we that's a whole nother topic of discussion. But in B2B sales, where if you don't talk to somebody, I think the recent stat from Gartner was like, self-service, although people are saying from a buyer side, oh yeah, I don't want to talk to sales. The buyer remorse from those that do that self-service side, do their own research and don't talk to sales is upwards of like 80%. Wow. So there's a challenge on that side. And I think at the end of the day where sales has the opportunity or the upper hand is to be that trusted advisor, which you're working yes. to do yes. so much. Completely agree. And um, I am very certain I'm not the first one to talk about consultative selling here. 
um, and the importance of it because you are hitting the nail on the head when you say people don't think they want to interact with people because they don't want to be sold, but at the same time, they want advice, they want to be consulted with, they want expertise in the area that they're looking to buy from. And so we have to train our sales team to be that consultative partner and make it less about selling and more about consulting and helping the buyer achieve the outcomes that they want to achieve to um, have a successful partnership and a valuable partnership on both both sides. And does that influence then the content and the training? Is a lot of that content I'm thinking and training that you're doing probably not just product knowledge. There's probably a lot more that you go into. What are some of those topics? It does. So we train on consultative selling and we set our tools up in a way that really enables consultative selling and helps to guide a seller if that is not their strongest competency or if they're still learning how to be a consultative seller. Um, And the way that we set up those tools are through, again, a lot of listening and asking open-ended questions. Um, And then learning again how to finesse your um your responses and your listening based on what they're saying and based on what they're really saying um and you and i had this brief conversation in the past about okay someone can say the same thing five different ways and we all know it means something different each time right so crisis Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I remember it well. Uh-huh. Yes. So taking a cue um, from a buyer and stopping to dig in where it's really necessary is key to success. So we're teaching these competencies, we're teaching sell- selling skills, um, and we're also designing our tools and training to help educate and train our team. That's awesome because at the end of the day, you're right. A a buyer values, and and this was some more research. I love getting to to dig in and nerd out on these things with you, but it's like four times more valuable business acumen versus product acumen to a buyer, right? Like, tell me, you know, my industry, tell me, you know, me and my pain points. And it's exactly what you were saying in that thank you note. So I know the team at co-op is doing an awesome job at that. Thank you. Yeah. So it leads... Yeah, it leads me into the next topic, which is core to this podcast, right? Which okay. is, I'm bullish on the fact that the days of the spam cannons of just putting more volume and more quantity out there are getting diminishing returns, mm-hmm. right? Kind of like content marketing had its heyday. Now there is so much content out there and so many things to download. None of us could ever get it all. What have you looked at? What's your philosophy there? Is that, do you agree, disagree? Tell me kind of what you've seen over the past. I agree. Um, I absolutely agree. I think there is so much to your point out there. And we need to have a personalized approach. We need to have one-on-one interactions. We need to get creative about how we're engaging people Um, and have a variety of ways, right? There's no one size fits all. You don't know where in all of your marketing or all of your efforts, someone's going to kind of enter the funnel, so to speak. So <laughs> where, you know, how can you engage them, your the audience with the right message at the right time for them? Um, so no, a, a, what did you call it? Shot cannon? Cannon oh, approach. spam cannon. Yep. Spam cannon. <laughs> spam cannon. I haven't heard that before, but I like it. Um, we No, that's not going to work. However, every once in a while, I do get some very creative emails, you know, people yeah. soliciting me. And I'm like, ooh, I kind of like that. I got one this morning that had like something about my name in the subject line. And I actually opened it. Um, so I think there are still creative ways out there that are not you know fully saturated yet in all of the different channels but um 
knowing what your audience wants and when to uh, engage them with the right message at the right time is really the challenge and the art. And some it is. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, I'm curious from an enablement side, I've always dreamed of the perfect sales process mapped out, little mm -hmm. pieces of content lined up to each little inflection point, all okay. the triggers, all those things working perfectly, kind of the, the incredible machine. Uh -huh. you, you can see that picture. I sure can. How do you look at content and mapping that out across the buying journey, especially as we all know, we'd love them to start from totally unaware and just move right on through this beautiful kind of, you know, yellow brick road of perfect, but that's not how they actually buy and learn about our products. How it's do you, not. It's how do you not. work through that? So yeah. I have an incredible team, um, leadership team, peer team, who I work with. And we each own different areas of marketing. So I really own the bottom of the funnel, the one on one engagements and um, starting to own some, and, you know, creeping into mid funnel where the products are coming together and we're talking about outcomes. And that really leads into that consultative approach. Um, mm -hmm. I also have a partner who works mid to top of funnel and then an events and experience partner. We are super connected in all of the content that we create and all of the work that we do. And we do a lot of mapping of our audience segments and we do, you know, the, yeah. the perfect map. Um, but we all know and recognize that that is not going to be exactly how it flows. And, you know, we love our events to accelerate purchase and they often do, but sometimes someone who's completely new to our organization might stumble upon one of our big conferences. So uh -huh. how are we going to make sure that we have the right messaging for that audience also? Um, and what it comes down to is all of the things, <laughs> knowing our knowing our market, knowing our audience, knowing the personas within each of those, um, and being flexible with um, our messaging and our, our versioning of our messaging to make sure it's tailored to the right person at the right time, and leveraging all of our channels. So um, we're connected from our highest level at top of the funnel where our content is out in the world all the way down mm -hmm. to um, our one-on-one -on -one conversations. And sales enablement, product marketing, I'm sure, supports that whole journey then. So there's, sure there's content at all stages. Yeah. It sure does. So we touch it That's all cool. and um, we use it all to make sure our sellers have the most resources and, and the most content and knowledge at their fingertips. And we have an incredible sales organization who are truly experts in their field and industry experts. And so back to the human element, that really all helps when you've got such a strong team of humans um, yep. to support all of this. Because it can't just all be automated. There's got to be that human yeah. touch. I think we're all saying, oh, AI and generative AI will just take away the human. But you know, our belief at Unifor is that, you know, the future of AI is augmenting and assisting that human, not not yes. eliminating it at all from the process. Agree. Absolutely yeah. agree. So a hot take, if there's one format or medium or type of content in the sales enablement function that you're seeing work best, that's getting the best traction, kind of, I would say mid or bottom of the funnel, Okay. What's what's some of the content that's really resonating and, and how are you bringing that to light? Is it through video? Is it through social channels? Sure. What are you seeing so work one of our top events, and I promise you I'm not just saying this because I host it, um, is our quarterly live cast. And it's a webinar. We get very high attendance. We have our executives join. We talk about our strategy. We talk about our products, our product statuses. Um, and most importantly, 
we usually hear from many of our customers, our credit unions, and they talk about how they are using their product, our products and solutions um, and the outcomes that they are achieving. So what I um, see most myself and hear from our sellers is that when we are able to show a credit union how another is using a product and uh, you know whether it's through a case study or through video on our live cast or through um even just a one-to-one -one phone call or reference and making that connection and bringing that to life and really validating the information and maybe the trends that a product is responding to um, mm -hmm. that is really our, our most successful, um, medium. That's awesome to hear because during COVID, during the pandemic, everything went virtual mm -hmm. and I, and you hear both sides, you hear the, well, the future is going to be virtual. And I think it is, but then also, oh, we have so much zoom fatigue. We have so much webinar fatigue, but done correctly. And this is what I want to call out. You can have a lot of success in that medium. And it sounds like almost yes. an Apple-esque type of product event for Co-op yes. Solutions, which is yes. pretty cool. It is. It's really cool. It's a lot of fun. We bring fun to it also. And maybe that's really what's keeping us, keeping it hot. Um, uh -huh. We try and really make it enjoyable. And I certainly enjoy it. I know my colleagues enjoy um, delivering the presentation and it's always fun to get our clients on as well. So they can kind of have their moment in the spotlight, but we continue to draw really strong audiences for that particular tactic. That's awesome. Well, anyone in the space, if you're in banking credit unions, make sure you're at that event or attending yes. that event, whether Please you know about co-op solutions or not, correct? Please Come join, join us. So I have to ask, what is the future of sales enablement? What's it look like to you? And what are you excited about? What am I excited about? I'm excited about a lot. Um, I do think, so I was, I had the great fortune of speaking at a sales enablement conference back in May. And nice. it's always exciting to me. Every time I speak at one of these, there's a certain level of chatter that rises about one topic or another, right? Like what's the, what's the mm -hmm. hot topic du jour? And this past May, it was without a doubt um, AI and all of the ways that different organizations are using it and um, how they're creating efficiencies, what it means for sellers and um, for tools and training and all of that. So I'm excited to see how all of this AI and chat GPT and all of the different technologies really mm -hmm. does impact our, our tools, our training, our selling, our interactions, and um, got a lot of really good ideas about just creating efficiencies for the team, mm -hmm. um, you know, we all know the, okay, generate a list of 10 impactful questions when you're doing discovery for a new client. That's mm -hmm. fantastic to get ideas flowing. And yeah. what a great way to start to get something on paper to start when you're documenting a strategy or when you're documenting um, your notes to prepare when before you're walking into a meeting with a client or with a, perspe a prospective new client. So... I know that that technology um, will evolve as it has very quickly. And I know people are, are so creative and we're at co-op thinking of ways that we can use it to um, enhance our client experience and our, our uh, selling experiences as well. So I am very excited about that. It's, it's a new frontier and it's going to be exciting to see, I think in so many ways, AI is going to change how we go to market, how yeah. we engage customers and also open up so many possibilities. You know, the one-to-one -one interactions or the one-to-few that are so labor intensive for a marketing organization, a sales organization to sometimes pull off. But when going up market are so critical, that's where I, I can't wait to see how we can do some of the things there with content enablement and those pieces. So yes, we will, we will have to see. So yes. 
I am so excited, Casey, to get to learn from you. But so our audience can learn a little bit about you. You talked a little bit about your background in sales mm-hmm. and and kind of where you're where you've come from. But tell us a little bit about Casey, personal sure. life, where you grew up, sure. kind of some of those things. What got you to here? So I am a Southern California native. Um, grew up in the South Bay and um, currently reside here now. Went a whole nine, no, eight miles away to LMU um, locally. But honestly, if you were here, you wouldn't blame me because it's the beach. It's beautiful weather. Although we did just have our uh, first hurricane. If you're not seeing my air quotes, their air quotes, hurricane, (laughs) um, which was downgraded to a tropical storm. Um, But it's it's typically gorgeous weather. Um, I have four children. They are a kindergartner, fresh kindergartner, second grade, fourth grade, and a fresh middle schooler in sixth grade now. Um, So we like to be outside a lot. Lots of sports games, soccer, baseball, tennis, ballet, And so we have to live here because we're outside all the time. And I would not tolerate those sports in 100 plus degrees or rain or snow. So we're not moving to Green Bay anytime soon then. What's that? (laughs) I said, you're not moving to Green Bay anytime soon. Not moving to Green Bay anytime soon. (laughs) Um, And so my husband uh, works from home as well. And uh, the kids are are gone during the day, so it's peaceful. We get our work done, and then it's madness the moment they return. And um, it's a it's a lot of loud noise, but it's a lot of fun. Hey, the work hard, play hard, right? It's that, exactly. that balance that goes back and forth. Yes, well, a little amazing. bit different than the traditional play hard, but um, our version of four <laughs> kids, no sleep, like constant yep. yelling play hard. <laughs> That's how we roll. <laughs> there you go. So with four kids growing up, I'm curious, we're going to go introspective and maybe one day you could share this clip with them. If you put yourself back graduating from LMU, just getting out of college, what would be some advice? Ooh, you know, I would say, um, this, is, uh, my advice is so cliche, um, but it would <laughs> be, okay. It would be follow your dreams. And I always, I always wanted a big family. um, But I've always also been, um, according to all of my, you know, personality tests, a hyper achiever, they call it. Um, And so I like to, I love being a working mom. I think it's fantastic for me because it fulfills my desire to achieve, my desire to, you know, make an impact on people, on my team. I love developing my team. Um, I love my organization because we are a cooperative that truly helps credit unions kind of, you know, the once known as the underdogs of the financial industry really having their moment right now. Um, especially in light of some of the banking issues that we've had in the in the past few months, um, mm-hmm. and so you're able. I I have been able to successfully follow my dreams in that I've had all of my children and been a working mother and been able to you know make an impact in uh, the corporate world as I've always desired to do. Um, and have fun along the way. Have a lot of fun. I like along that the one way. too. Yeah. Both, both good advice, but both wrapped up in, in what I have to say is just awesome. I grew up, I have two older sisters, seen the same thing with them. And it, being a mom is a full time, all hands on deck job. Yes. So to be able to do both, I commend you. And I just think in the sales profession, in the marketing profession, We need more of that, right? Like that is something we've worked with Girls Club and Lauren Bailey and some of those ones there. We we help support women in sales. And I I just, 
I think they're, they're truly some of the best sellers that I've ever worked with. And, and so they get it. They have the empathy there and the soft skills that just yes. resonate so much more. Yes. And I mean, someone said to me the other day, like, if you have a problem, just ask a working mom. They know how to do anything. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> not to like toot my own working mom horn, but oh, yeah. it's kind of true. Like <laughs> we figure out how to work from anywhere. We figure, you know, we're at the doctor's yep. appointment, uh, you know, do, just making it work. And um, there's a certain set of problem solving skills that goes along with that, that is 1000% applicable in corporate corporate America. So, oh, yeah. And in so Understanding many other how to, oh, yeah. <laughs> staying, staying calm in the chaos and, and being yes. able to see things through. Absolutely. Yes. Well, Casey, where can people get in touch? Tell us a little bit about Co-op Solutions and kind of give me that rundown. So if they're listening to this podcast and going, I want to learn more about Co-op Solutions Great. or I want to connect with Casey, how can they do that? Yes. Find me on LinkedIn, um, Casey Stinson, Casey with a K. You'll see it on the um, on the the bio, I'm sure. And, yes, and we'll have um, it in the show notes. Yep. Yeah, exactly in the show notes. And co-op um, will be at a bunch of industry conferences coming up in the fall. Um, nice. So we are in. Utah and Washington, Montana, South Carolina. We're at Go West. We're at Max. Um, for those of you who in the, are in the industry and are familiar with these conferences, um, so we will have co-op subject matter experts speaking at all of those. Um, we'll be coming around probably to a town near you based on all of those <laughs> locations um, yep. in the fall. And you can go to our website, coop.org. And if you're interested in, um, if you are a credit union and you're interested in learning more about our technology or um, the outcomes that we can help you achieve, definitely reach out. We're also on social, um, Co-op Solutions on LinkedIn and on YouTube. Ah, perfect. And this podcast will also be on YouTube. So if you want to catch the video, the air quotes of our hurricane and so much more, <laughs> please check us out there as well. Um, Casey, it has been so fun to have you on and to learn from you. And there's so much sales enablement and product marketing knowledge we can all glean. I hope others get in touch and I can't wait to stay in touch with you and, and learn from you as you continue to grow. Likewise. Thanks so much, Tim. Hey, thank you. And to all of our listeners out there, please subscribe, like, share, and you can listen to this wherever you listen to your podcast, wherever. So make sure to tune in and check out this episode and many others. And uh, we will be back next time with another episode of B2B EQ. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com. <laughs>